This afternoon, we're fortunate to have the Deputy Secretary, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Climate and Policy at the Department of Transportation, Mr. Andrew Wishan. Uh, Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you to the Meridian International Center for hosting this important discussion. And I wanted to particularly thank Nicole Bambus and our uh, domestic team in the Office of the Secretary for helping to prepare me um, for being before you today. Uh, greatly appreciated. The Biden-Harris administration views climate change as a defining challenge of our time. President Biden rejoined the Paris Accords and at the White House Climate Summit earlier this year that convened leaders from across the globe, he laid out our target to cut U.S. carbon emissions in half by 2030 and reach net zero economy-wide emissions by 2050. That will take all of us working together domestically and internationally. We know that. And it will take both urgent action and a long-term strategic vision. Uh, so our race to stop the climate crisis is not just a question of what will be lost if we fail. It's really about what can be gained if we succeed. The transition to a cleaner economy means millions of good paying American jobs, prevailing wage jobs, retrofitting you know, existing infrastructure assets and building new ones, making infrastructure more resilient, installing electric vehicle chargers, and manufacturing the electric vehicles themselves in supporting the transition to life cycle zero emission fuels here in America. We know that transportation, which is the largest contributor of greenhouse gas emissions in the US and a major contributor globally, must play a major role in the solution. Secretary Buttigieg has made climate change a top priority for our department in our domestic policies and our international cooperation. So we're working with partners across the globe to promote climate action and to share climate-related best practices in transportation. And we're working uh, and looking forward to a successful COP26 next month, furthering global commitments on climate including the transportation sector. In the historic bipartisan infrastructure framework that President Biden reached, now the bipartisan infrastructure deal, we have a once in a generation opportunity to meet this consequential moment and win the future. And the time has come to break, you know, this old false framework of climate versus jobs. The, the agreement would create millions of new jobs, including climate jobs. It'll fix and modernize our transportation system, and we're giving people options to leave their cars behind. This would be the largest investment in passenger rail since the creation of Amtrak. It would also be the largest federal investment in public transit in American history, including seven and a half billion for electric buses and transit, seven and a half billion for highway charging, and even more for, for electric transit. And then 13 billion will be used to improve road safety including for people who walk, bike, or use a wheelchair. The agreement also allocates seven and a half billion for highway EV, EV charging alone. That will also empower the US to win the EV market from helping automakers establish stronger domestic supply chains to building a network of half a million EV chargers all over the country, including in rural areas. It also matters tremendously where the energy for electric vehicles comes from. This agreement is the largest investment in clean energy transmission in American history. Let me say that again. This agreement is the largest investment in clean energy transmission in American history. Really excited about that. The infrastructure bill would also support port and maritime decarbonization, which we know is one of the hard to abate sectors. In addition to electrification, support for research, demonstration, and technology and alternative fuels infrastructure are also part of the package. But what's our role to date at USDOT? As we advance the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the broader climate priorities of the American Jobs Plan, we're continuing to do what we can with the resources and authorities that we currently have. We've added climate as a criterion in our discretionary grant programs, which is already bearing fruit. The Federal Highway Administration also announced our fifth round of new so-called alternative fuel corridors these designations represent progress toward building out a national network of EV charging and alternative fuel stations to support long distance travel. 
we also issue new guidance to help states use their right of way, uh, not just for the transportation use, but really for the highest and best use to host transmission lines, build renewable energy projects, and support EV charging infrastructure as well. The Federal Aviation Administration, working across government, will release an updated Aviation Climate Action Plan later this year, outlining key actions across government to help aviation address its climate impacts. And just speaking of which, our plan there highlights that there's no single solution for aviation, and we're eager to work with our industry and international colleagues through a variety of means to enable aviation to do its part in addressing climate change. And staying with the aviation sector, the administration recently announced a broad suite of actions aimed at making aviation more sustainable. These actions include policy measures, technological advancements, and executive actions that will reduce aviation's climate impacts. One key action that we wanted to lift up here is the newly announced government-wide Sustainable Aviation Fuel Grand Challenge. The Grand Challenge aims to meet the demand for sustainable aviation fuels, or SAF as it's known, as the most promising near to midterm means to addressing aviation's climate impact by working with stakeholders to reduce costs, enhance sustainability, and expand production and use of SAF, achieving a minimum of a 50% reduction in life cycle greenhouse gas emissions compared to conventional fuel. And one of the goals of the Grand Challenge is 3 billion gallons of SAF by 2030, enough to power about 10% of US aviation. In maritime, DOT continues through the Maritime Administration to support the Maritime Environmental and Medi uh, Technical Assistance Program, META as it's known. Um, I tend to refer to it as META so we don't have to uh, use that, that long um, title to demonstrate emerging technologies on board vessels and ports. As it relates to maritime, we need to recognize that our ports are major international hubs. Um, so we're producing investments in our ports, um, in the global economy and supply chain to support both domestic and inter international shipping. And we're also actively engaged in a number of efforts and forums dedicated to decarbonizing the maritime sector and raising international ambition to push for zero emission international shipping by 2050. Even as we work to reduce the impact of climate emissions, we need to make our systems more resilient against the climate change we're experiencing now. In 2020, as many of you know, the United States saw 22 climate-related disaster events, each with losses exceeding a billion dollars, a cumulative price tag of nearly a hundred billion dollars. I think that's the most climate-related disaster events that we've ever had in one year. We draw inspiration from the New Deal's infrastructure projects and President Eisenhower's interstate highway system, but we cannot afford to rely on the original version of the roads, bridges, and airports they built all those years ago. They need new investments, and that's impossible to ignore. We see it in the sections of California's Highway 1 that fell into the ocean. We see it in the Gulf Coast flooding that halted rail service across Hurricane Harvey. And we see it in the floods in Michigan, the wildfires in California, the deadly snowstorm in Texas, and the I-5 buckling in the Pacific Northwest. That goes for our road funding too, which cannot just be about building massive new highways. So our proposed resilience investments would support projects across America that reinforce, upgrade, or realign existing transportation infrastructure to better withstand extreme weather events and other effects of climate change. We have strategies available to make our infrastructure more resilient, but they require investment and include building better or retrofitting existing infrastructure, including through the use of nature-based solutions, adding redundancy by building new connections, and relocating transportation assets to less vulnerable locations. DOT is working to incentivize those strategies. It, let me just give you a, a few examples. The Federal Aviation Administration, for instance, is developing a national airport strategy to provide a top-down framework for investments in resilient airport infrastructure. The Federal Highway Administration has partnered with more than 50 pilot project teams across the country 
to conduct climate change vulnerability assessments and analyze options for improving resilience. And the Federal Transit Administration has developed a tool to enable transit agencies to conduct risk-weighted cost-benefit analysis for proposed resilience projects. In conclusion, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill is really a chance to empower America's workers, secure climate, and restore America's leadership position in an increasingly competitive world. And by the way, we're excited about the reconciliation package that uh, may advance as well and, and include significant climate investments. It's our chance to build a future where transportation inspires dreams and not dread, a source of opportunity rather than a constraint on the budgets and livelihoods of American workers and families. American livelihoods rise or fall based on infrastructure choices that reverberate for decades. This plan is how the generations now in charge make good on our response responsibility to keep the American dream alive for the generation now coming of age and those to follow. But as you know, I don't have to tell you this, we, we really need your leadership to tackle this problem together. The U.S. Department of Transportation is committed to doing our part, working closely with our partners in state and local government, industry, nonprofit organizations, international partners, and others to combat the climate crisis. So we look forward to working with you on this generational change and challenge. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, for Climate Policy for DOT, Andrew Wisher, thank you very much for your time this morning. Now, let's move to the, the program that we've all been waiting for. Uh, let me do a quick introduction. We got time that we are up against, so I'm not going to read their bios. In fact, uh, the right Honorable Lord uh, Barker's uh, background would probably take us most of the session, so I will not do that and I won't embarrass him. But uh, Lord Barker was appointed as the independent chairman of the e, &E Board of Directors on October 22nd, 2017, immediately prior to the company's successful IPO in London. In February 2019, he was appointed as executive chairman of the board. Um, he is clearly uh, a, a man of parliament of the British House of Commons, 20, 2001 to 2015. Um, Lloyd Barker has extensive experience in energy sector mergers and acquisitions and corporate finance. And I'll stop there. You all, most of you can read, so you can read the rest of the information about him. But he is clearly a responsible adult and knows this subject very, very well. Our second uh, uh, participant is uh, Michael Tran, Senior Vice President, Chief Sustainability, Sustainability Officer, excuse me, for Emerson. Michael Tran was named Emerson's first Chief Sustainability Officer in March of 2021. In, his, in this role, he leads the company's environmental sustainability strategy with a focus on advancing technologies and advocacy to enhance company operations. So with that, um, I would like to move to some questions. Um, Lloyd Barker, uh, if you could help us understand as we're having this conversation with the backdrop of the COP26 and President Biden's infrastructure bill, can you discuss some of the external pressures that work in the space? How are these helping to propel innovation? We don't have sound guys. We can't hear him. Yeah, I don't think that's at my end. Thank you very much, Alonzo. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir, I can hear you very well. Thank you. Well, very good to uh, to be on and a great pleasure to uh, and privilege to follow the undersecretary there with uh, and great to hear uh, the things that are really happening on the ground here uh, over here in the States. Um, so what are we going to expect for COP26 uh, in Glasgow? Um, although these these UN conferences actually happen every year, this is really the next seminal uh, uh, com uh, UN conference on climate um, since the, the, the uh, landmark Paris Agreement back in 2015. The interesting thing, though, I think about this particular uh, UN milestone is that whereas the previous conferences have really just been about governments, nation states coming together to agree or not agree uh, a common way forward, here, I think we're going to see an unprecedented role for the private sector. 
And I know that uh, Secretary Kerry uh, here in the US takes a similar view that actually now there is a recognition that this isn't just shared responsibility, but the solutions are very much in the hands of the private sector. There is only so much that governments can do. Now, don't get me wrong, it's absolutely crucial that first and foremost, we get a clear direction and commitment to ambitious reduction in climate, uh, in, uh, in CO2 emissions from all the world's governments um, and a commitment to net zero by 2050, ideally, from all the major economies, and that we somehow keep um, alive that idea that we can limit man-made climate change um, to just a one and a half degree increase. But it, even that looks tricky. But there is a real uh, uh, recognition that the private sector are equal partners, particularly the heavy emitting industrial sectors. And, and the encouraging thing I take from this is that whereas you know, five or six years ago at Paris, ESG, climate change, the green agenda was a nice to have for many companies. And there were, there, there were and have been a number of uh, leading pioneers in this subject. It was effectively a minority sport for most. It wasn't something that was front and central to most uh, board discussions. That's not the case there now. Um, whether you are a climate skeptic um, or a climate zealot, I think it doesn't matter. Every board of every major company now has climate change and ESG bang smack at center, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because their investors are, sit are insisting on it, because their banks won't lend unless they can understand the risk that there is around uh, climate action and because they're not going to get a rating unless they can prove to their investors that they are future-proofed and have got a strategy for dealing with this most pressing question. Very nice. Um, Michael, can you touch on a couple of things that he talked about from a private, private sector perspective? Sure, we'll do. And I, I, I would uh, echo Lord Barker's comments there. You know, as a private companies, I think our investor universe has leaned into this massively in the last two years. You know, I view that dam has been broken. Everybody is, is leaning forward on this. And I think, you know, even, even in my new role of chief sustainability officer, you know, I, I have a once or twice a year plan duty to report to the board, but every board meeting now goes into this topic. I mean, I'm we're having the conversation all the time now. So, so we've just seen that across the board, across all companies, I think really in these last 18 months. You know, at Emerson, we're focused on, you know, I'm the chief sustainability officer, took that role in March. You know, I'm focused on the greening of Emerson, what we need to do in our four walls, the focus where we want to put there, inclusive of our supply chain and, you know, in the broader context there. Our technologies are generally automation. So we're serving a lot of customers with that automation so they can get their improvements and their progress in sustainability. So that's a whole greening buy kind of category of activities. And then like today, I think there's a, there's a whole category around greening with, how do we collaborate with governments and, and research groups and industry groups to come together to add, you know, to have real pathway discussions and then how do we figure out how to make progress down this pathway? So that's kind of the way we're viewing, Alonzo, our kind of our, our strategy or sustainability framework as we look forward. Look, Lloyd Barker, back to you. Talk to us a little bit about um, how e, e leverages hydropower to process aluminum. How does the power generated by e, &E in in e &E plus hydro facilities fuel other industries and consumers? Sure, uh, absolutely. I was going to say, I totally agree with what Mike was saying there. Although I have to say, when he spoke about his new role, given the background that he's got uh, on his Zoom call, I thought his new role was President of the United States rather than. My background game. One, 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 one job at a time. One job at a time. Um, but anyway, so let me tell you um, why we're able to make. The world's lowest carbon uh, aluminium and we and at the mpass group we are the second largest supplier of uh, aluminum to north america and the uh, largest supplier of aluminium uh, to uh, to europe as we call it over uh, over there um but the reason is that we're uh, we leading our sector is not because we're the biggest, but because we're the lowest carbon. And why we're the lowest carbon is because we use a clean energy source to make this very energy intensive 
metal. Um, now, to put that in some sort of context, 60% of the world's uh, aluminum comes from China, and they use coal-fired electricity. Mm -hmm. Now, that means that it takes 16 as tons of carbon to make one ton of Chinese aluminum, whereas it takes us, because we're using a clean energy source, two and a half tons. Mm -hmm. So two and a half versus 16. It's, a, it's not just a better, it's not just best in class, it's a massive difference. And we can do that because we have this huge hydro resource. To put it in context, at the uh, EN Plus group, we have 16 gigawatts of hydro. That's eight times the Hoover Dam. Um, wow. So it's a wonderful, wonderful um, uh, clean resource that used responsibly can help um, power uh, energy intensive industries. And, but we need more of it. We need absolutely more. It doesn't all have, we need more clean energy and we need reliable clean energy that can input into industry. But you know, the other point is when you're for, particularly for things like um, metals that are being used to build the low, the, the low carbon economy, because who are our biggest customers? Electric vehicle manufacturers, uh, renewable energy infrastructure uh, manufacturers, sustainable packaging. Um, re, uh, sustainable construction. There's no point building these things unless the actual materials that you're using are also low carbon. All you do is otherwise is just displace uh, carbon from America or Europe to China. And that's, that's the old model and can't be pursued. So I would say there's huge potential for industries across the board, but particularly energy intensive industries like ours to switch to clean energy sources, and obviously we're a huge, huge advocate of the role of hydro, but it could be wind, could be solar, could be, could be other sources as well. Mike, I know you, I see you rocking back and forth in, in affirmative. Uh, we talked a little bit about this earlier, but can you share with the audience about the manufacturing products that not only require huge amounts of energy, but also can lead to environmentally destructive byproducts? Can you talk about how Emerson is addressing that issue for the audience, please? So Alonzo, I think, you know, if I think about Emerson, you know, we, we tend, our, our, we are a manufacturer, but we bring together steel and electronics and plastics and, you know, copper and some other things that's in our supply chain, right? Mm -hmm. That we bring together, we assemble, we test, obviously, then we, we take them to our customers and they in turn use them in their, it, to automate the, the, the things they're doing. So I'm working on our own personal roadmap, right? How, how can we get progress, not just in our four walls, where I'm spending a lot of energy with our employees, mm -hmm. uh, engaging them, teaching them, we're doing energy treasure hunts, we're being more energy efficient, we're sourcing more renewable energy into our mix, you know, to help uh, aid our own emissions profile. But I'm really figuring out how do I engage that supply chain? We have 18,000 suppliers globally. We, we operate all over the world, uh, very active, pretty regionalized in terms of how we approach things. And, you know, some of those companies are in the public eye, they have you know, ESG interested investors, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're gonna get it, right? They're already kind of getting there. We have a lot of other suppliers who are privately held, they're small, they're family owned companies, you know, they don't quite understand yet this perspective from the ESG side that Lord Barker referenced a moment ago. So I'm spending my time right now figuring out how to engage that supply chain, those partners, uh, and trying to coach them on what our program is. I'm trying to get them, encourage them to stand up their own programs. Um, and then, you know, we got to work on abatement. So for example, in steel, you know, it's a process that requires high temperatures. That's what, that's traditionally been driven by fossil fuels to get those high temperatures. Electrification probably isn't going to solve the problem totally there. So there's a, there's a case where we're, you know, we're, we're looking at hydrogen as a potential molecule that can be right. a molecule that goes along with electrons, but the molecule of the future that can help abate some of those really high temperature processes. I think cement will be the same. Uh, I applaud Lord Barker and, and his, his group in terms of already having some of that hydroelectric power to, uh, as sources. And, you know, we need that mentality to go to go everywhere throughout our supply chain as we move forward. Uh, talk a little bit about the training. What role does that play? I mean, you didn't really touch on that. And it's also, uh, how are you ensuring that regulations are being met? So a couple of things there. One is around education, right? First, uh, bring your employees up to a level of understanding and awareness and, and getting them 
uh, familiar with all of these concepts. Uh, the good news is there's high passion, and, I, and I, I would hope Lord Barker would agree with me. You know, the young people of the world are leading the charge. We have some older people who also believe in this that are now becoming more vocal about it, which is terrific and, and great. So this isn't one of these things we have to like push to make happen in the company. There's people who want this to, make, to happen. So we got to arm them with the tools and the training, the tool, you know, how to do this. How do they go about this so they, so they can take action? And I, I, I always argue for, you know, progress. Don't go for perfection, make progress. We got to keep making progress. We need to be urgent about making progress uh, as we go forward. You know, on the regulatory front, working with our government friends and our research friends, you know, I, I, I advocate for getting some at scale implementations. We need some hydrogen ecosystem things now. We need some carbon capture now. We, we're doing a pretty good job with biofuels and biogases using waste to create energy. We need to keep pushing on that as we go forward. And then the whole circular economy and the plastics recycling streams and those kinds of things. So I, a lot of excitement for this. I'm very passionate about it. I'm very optimistic for it. But you know, with the 2030 kind of interim deadlines and the 2050, ultimately, we got to get pretty busy if we're going to start hitting those deadlines with kind of changes to the way our energy system works today and what it's going to look like tomorrow. Lloyd Parker, back to you. Um, how do you ensure that your local operations are not only abiding by local environmental regulations, but going beyond those met uh, that meet the standards of ENN Plus? What role does training and community engagement play? And before you answer that, I want to implore the audience, please send questions. We've got quite a few coming in, but this is an incredible topic right now. And it's on everybody's mind. And we've got two of the pre premier experts in the world right now talking about this issue from a policy and private sector perspective. So please bring your questions. Go for uh, Alonso, yeah, absolutely right. I and mean, we employ over 100,000 people in 12 countries right the way around the world on five continents. So mm -hmm. this is a big challenge. Um, so we've got to use every single communication channel going mm -hmm. in order to pull people in to what we think is the central mission to our business, which is to drive towards net zero. We became the first uh, company in our sector globally to have a net zero target. We've also got the most ambitious uh, 2030 target of our, um, of our, of our sector. Um, and we've got a detailed plan. So I think you've got to have a have got to get your employees on board you've got to show that you're sincere and that you have actually got a plan that this isn't just a load of green waffle for external use um you've got to um answer their questions take it seriously have small meetings as well as the distribution of larger information through uh, the normal uh company information information channels so that that's that's really uh important for us but keep everything credible um, you know, over 2,000 public companies have now issued net zero targets for 2050, but less than 200 have actually issued route maps of how they're going to deliver that 2050 target. And it's really important that leadership comes from the top, but that wow. leadership adds up to more than just mouthing the right platitudes, issuing the right press releases. It's got to be able to demonstrate what are you doing if you're the CEO or the chairman, what are you doing during your tenure rather than just storing out problems that you're going to neatly hand over to the next bloke that, take, that uh, comes into the chair? Yeah, this is to both of you. It's the first question that came in. Um, how do companies and hard to abate sectors engage local communities as they try to reduce emissions? Well, let me take a swing at that. You know, I think, first of all, these real roadmaps that Lord Barker just referenced, I think we need to be out there communicating those. As companies, we need to communicate that. I think our governments need to do a better job, frankly, of, of really depicting what these real roadmaps will look like. Mm -hmm. So that everybody, again, I think everybody wants to make this happen, but they need to know how to make it happen and what their role is to play and, and how they play. So I think keeping that front and center on things, I think, uh, you know, not being sort of, um, uh, you know, being real that the hard to abate industries are difficult, they're challenging. You know, we need good stewards like Lord Barker to show the way on these things. We need to support them in that journey. Mm -hmm. uh, so not being exclusionary either with investing or exclusionary with talent, you know, but to help help nurture and support these things as we go forward. So I think raising that communication level and, and sharing how an individual can make an impact as we go forward. 
I think also one of the things in the climate world that we need to do is make sure that we standardize the language, standardize the metrics, standardize the reporting as far as possible across industries, but also across uh, countries, because there is so much technical you know, verbiage, which actually is impenetrable to a lot of normal people that are just trying to get a handle on what's happening. Um, so it's really important that we can communicate easily in language that people understand, but also having these standard metrics are really important. And in a lot of sectors, you still don't have commonly set standards. And if you don't measure something, you can't manage it. It's the old the old adage. So it's really, and I think governments have a role there to actually impose uniform reporting standards mm -hmm. so that actually you are comparing like with like and people can see how their efforts fit in to the wider efforts of either the, the country or the sector or even the, the global pattern. So you need to make fe people feel they can understand where they fit into this huge global effort. Yeah, perfect. Another great question uh, coming in. Uh, when, when discussing achieving net zero, many times there is a, a gender component to the conversation. Is that something that is discussed in the hard to abate sectors? Oh, now that's an that's a good question. Mm, great um, question. Great well, question. Mm -hmm. I have to say, one of the things I'm quite proud of is that um, I have increased. I haven't got to pa gender parity yet, but on my board, um, we are uh, we are over a th over a third uh, of my colleagues are women. Okay. Um, uh, we also have diversity on on the um, on the board, um, and that that's something. And you know, you get you just get better results from having a. A diverse, you know, a diverse selection of people, whether it's on the board, whether it's in management, whether it's on the shop floor, because you get a more challenging conversation. And the, one of the things I think that particularly engaged in the climate agenda suffer from occasionally, and I plead guilty to that as well, is sort of groupthink, that yeah. everyone sort of, you know, sounds and moves in, in the same direction, and no one ever stands back and stress tests, stress tests um, the strategy or step stress tests the, uh, the, the arguments sufficiently. So if you bring in diversity, if you get gen gender balance, you're much more likely to arrive at the right answers, apart from it being the fair and right thing to do. My, Lord Barker, let me say on this open forum here, uh, kudos to you and your team. Uh, I hope others will follow your lead. And Mike, you're on the spot. How's your board doing on these kinds of things? So, you know, it's interesting, Alonzo. We have two long-term goals out there. We have our carbon intensity reduction target that we put out two and a half years ago we're working on, and we have our representation inclusion target. So two, two goals. And actually, these are the first times we've ever had anything long term. We've always had financial goals, but you know, they're one, two, three years out. You know, these are kind of eight, nine years with some, you know, massive movements anticipated to, to, to do these. I think the one thing that's been really interesting is, is our board's very involved and very engaged in this. Our investors are obviously interested. But be, because we put these out publicly and externally, our organization said, oh my goodness, tone from the top, dead serious about this and starting to make those movements. So, you know, all the work around representation and, you know, in, in, in our minorities in the United States context, making progress there, not easy. You know, we're, we're, we're trying to draw, we use a lot of STEM engineering related talents, getting that talents to come to industry, getting it to come to us on top of that. A lot of hard work to make that happen. You have to be very intentional and very deliberate about how you do things. And I think we're doing that. Uh, and the same thing with our whole approach to emissions and broadly the environmental sustainability topic. So I think it's very exciting times. Um, you know, the future of talent to come to us is really important. The future of work with the digitalization mm -hmm. uh, is obviously changing everything as we go forward. I echo Lord Barker's comments on the measuring. I think we are capable of measuring more. I think we're capable, maybe, again, we've been kind of working through self-disclosure as part of this process. And I think companies have gotten more comfortable with that over time and being more transparent over time. And maybe someday we'll be more transparent with something that's close to real time, actually, uh, metric uh, sharing, if you will, with the broader community. So I, I think there's, stay tuned. I think there's a lot more to develop in this space. I think it's be quite exciting as we go forward. I'm being bombarded with questions. Uh, I think it was you, Lord Barker, that sparked this, but folks are asking, how can young people like myself work at a company like yours? What are the skill sets that you are looking for and new hires in, in order to work for a company like yours? That's the question. 
for both well, of you. Why don't they just send in your CV and we'll we'll come back? But we <laughs> hey, we need some too. <laughs> yeah. There's just, enough I, to go around, guys. Enough to go around. Hey, listen, uh, we got about. Yeah, go ahead. Very good luck, Mark. I'm sorry. Obviously, we have a lot of very technical, very specialist people, of which I'm not one. Um, but I think you know, there's a lot to be said for passion and commitment and imagination. Um, and if you, that takes you a very long way. And we are going through a period of profound change that's coming faster and more profound. And the thing is, I'm a great optimist, but there are going to be winners and losers in this low carbon transition. Um, and you need to recognize that. So we really, really, you know, what Mike was saying earlier, we need to recognize the urgency of this agenda. And uh, you know, we're keen to, we're gonna lead it. We're gonna lead this in our sector, um, and, but we're only gonna do that. We've got like great young people with us. Yeah. Mike, Mike you wanna take a stab? You all right? I, I'm with you on that. I, first of all, we need talent to come and help these hard to abate industries. That is such an important mission. And I hope people will see that. Uh, the management teams have to empower them. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, look forward to, you know, this, these next 25 years are so important for the world. And, and I think the young groups joining us now, it'll still be within the span of their careers. This is going to be a big deal. So and, really look forward to it as we go. Actually, if I could just say, kudos to young people, because, you know, go back a few years, nobody wanted to work in industry. Everyone wanted to work in tech or in investment yeah. banking or mm -hmm. advertising. And I think a lot of young people realize if you want to fix the world's problems, you've got to go into the you know, the, the manufacturing industries and the big abating at the big emitting industries and help them solve those problems because there isn't a low carbon economy unless you can fix these things. So come on in and help us fix them. So okay, we've got, we got about four, five minutes left and I'm gonna give you the last, you guys take two and a half minutes each, okay? What are some of the persistent challenges that you're seeing and have been unable to overcome? If no solution pathways yet, how are you working with partners, the government and non-governmental community-based organizations to overcome these obstacles? Let me, let me go first. A couple of things we're working on. One is participating in some of the at-scale deployments of these novel solutions. So important right now. We got to learn from them technologically. We got to learn from them economically. We got to learn from, from a policy standpoint. You know, what, what incentives do we need? What regulations do we need? You know, what, how, how, to, how can our governments work cross borders? To make to make these things happen, so I, I think that's a really big thing as we go forward. So we got to keep pushing on that. Um, sooner versus later, we need to learn so we know these roadmaps will be solid as we go forward. Um, you know, I think a lot of companies now are leaning into. You know, I'm I'm out there trying to buy renewable energy right now. We're going to run into critical supply chains yeah. issues on this as we go forward, and and we can't be too patient about that. So I think regionalizing, you know, the lithium to processing to battery chain and uh, the, all the different chains that we want to have as we go forward here. These critical supply chains, I think, are extremely important. Regionalizing those and making sure that uh, we're, we're driving forward on those as well. I'll leave it there, Lord Barker. I'll leave you with the final words here. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with you about supply chains. So, I mean, like right now, sort of the shortage of magnesium and silicon is a is a real issue, and obviously, we're all aware of uh, other industries about the shortage of. Uh, of chips, so um, addressing these critical supply chain industry uh, supply chain issues and trying wherever possible to diversify and bring closer to home those supply chains is really important. While at the same time recognizing, certainly if you're building a global green economy, that you have to recognize that we need to break down some barriers. So one of the things that I'm an increasing advocate of is green free trade. That mm -hmm. you know, ultimately we're going to need to have carbon border adjustment mechanisms. We're going to need to put a price on carbon, but also we can make a good start by helping businesses by just zero rating tariffs on green goods and services. So if, it's, if, you know, if there's something you need to bring into the country, zero rate that for the, for the struggling small business that's trying to create that, you know, that, that green product for their business. Likewise, going to make it easier for them to export as well. So free trade in green goods and services is uh, my, my sort of big idea. Um, and then just what we do, what, what is the problem we have closer to home within the, com within the company? I think trying to encourage management to adopt a can-do attitude beyond the existing uh, investment cycle or beyond the current budgeting cycle and convince them that we can have the confidence to rely on solutions that may not be yet fully developed. 
and that we're asking them to put that, say, for example, to meet our 2030 goal, at the end of the decade, there are some things that we're going to have to do that we haven't quite yet completely worked out, but we've just got to have the confidence and the determination that we are going to do this. And that is a slight change of mentality for a lot of people that like to have everything explained on, you know, uh, in their model um, with no variables. And so just having that liberating management to think um, with greater confidence about their own ability to tackle problems in the future is very important. Just quickly, three things that young people can do in order to make a difference. Raise uh, your voice. <laughs> Raise your voice. Yeah, number of vote. That's a very important, uh, very, vote is certainly important. Raise your voice, as you say. And, and also, you know, just start making those changes in your own life that you want other people to, uh, to be. Be a responsible consumer, be a responsible investor, be a responsible citizen, but don't, you know, but also, you know, enjoy life you know, be optimistic, be can do, don't allow this to sort of crowd in and, and constrain your choices and constrain your worldview, be optimistic and um, get out there and help fix some of the problems. I love that. Those are great. Those I'm going to steal great. those from you. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we've run out of time. Uh, the Right Honorable Lord Barker, uh, Michael Tran, uh, two very interesting panelists, uh, experts on the subject matter. Keep spreading the gospel and keep being successful. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Thanks so much. Great to be with you. All right, take care.